Welcome to the Catholic Sphere. Each week we have a different host and a different focus as we tackle topics important to Catholics around the globe. I'm your host this week, Debbie Cowden, and this week we'll be doing a marriage masterclass with a special focus on Ephesians 5. And it tends to get bad rap because in verse 22, St. Paul instructs women to be subject or submissive to their husbands. But my panelists today are going to explain what Ephesians 5 means and what it doesn't mean. So today we have with us the content editor for spiritualdirection.com and a spiritual director herself, Claire Dwyer. The founder and creative director of Blessed Is She, Jenna Gizar. And lastly, we're joined by the man on fire himself, the founder and president of World of Blaze Incorporated, John Sablon. All our guests join us today from Arizona. Thank you so much for joining me, you all. Now we'll jump right in. Claire, in Ephesians 5, it states that wives are to be subject to their husbands. And this can be really hard for women to accept, especially in the wake of so much uh, secular emphasis on feminism and being a strong, independent woman. And many girls, myself included, grew up more or less being told that we didn't need a man. And so now we're married or we're hoping to get married and we might still have that mentality. So what are some of the problems that this toxic mindset has caused for marriage and for families? Well, uh, you know, it's a mutual dying to self that marriage really calls us to, laying down our lives for the other, uh, which means that a woman has to be in full possession of herself in order to give herself away. So we're not talking about women being subservient or um, doormats. In fact, a woman, in order to make a full authentic gift of herself, has to be fully alive in Christ um, fully knowing who she is. And so this is the work of a lifetime. So the, the invitation in Ephesians 5 for a woman is to be holy herself, to be in full possession of herself, and to give them away freely and generously to her husband, to her children, and to the world. And it's easier said than done, but Jenna, it's critical. It's absolutely critical that we get this order correct, this relationship correct when it comes to submission and marriage, not just for the sake of our own holiness or our spouse's holiness, but also for our children's well-being as well. And um, as a wife, how have you seen your marriage impacted by striving to submit to and to value your husband in marriage? I think so much of it in our own marriage has been about the dignity of the other person. I very much want to honor the dignity in my husband. And he, like Claire said, it's mutual. He wants to honor the dignity of me and who I am. Um, primarily, our concern as husband and wife are to first be a son or daughter of the father. That is our main vocation. That is what we're called to live um, into as Christians. And as Claire said, that's what we want to do every single day. We want to fully embrace our identity as a son and a daughter of the father. And so we do that by mutually respecting each other to put that first. Um, so we talk a lot. We have a lot of communication about uh, where we're at in our prayer lives or what's happening in our family life or what's going on in work. Um, we have to communicate a lot. And that has been the primary, um, I think, catalyst to us really understanding this about each other is to communicate and to talk to each other and open up about what's going on in our lives so that we can continue to, um, again, put, put what's primary uh, in its primary spot. And I'm so glad that you you mentioned those specific things that you do to help support each other and to communicate with each other. And John, I think people tend to get hung up on the term subject or subordinate or submissive in Ephesians 5, uh, and they see it as demoting the woman to being a second-class mm -hmm. citizen or a servant to the husband. But, but that's not quite right, especially as Claire and Jenna have illustrated for us. So can you explain some of the terminology that St. Paul used especially in the context of the time in which he wrote the letter. Absolutely, yeah. I think a lot of us, especially with our modern ears, when we hear that word, we have a certain perspective or misconception of what it is. If you look <laughs> at the Greek word, hupotasso is the actual word, and it really literally means to uh, place yourself or arrange yourself. And when 
uh, under. And so when St. Paul's talking in this context, and if you go further in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six, you know, put on the armor of God. So St. Paul's using military terms. And really, if the way I try to simplify it when I talk to other couples about this is really, it's placing yourself under the mission of, right? So uh, but as both Claire and Jenna said, there's this mutual submission. Uh, really, Ephesians 5, 21 talks about out of reverence for Christ, out of this fear for the Lord. And so there's this upholding of the dignity of both spouses, equal in the eyes of God as dignified children, but different and unique in their call to serve, especially in this vocation of marriage. And so really, if we understand the, the, the word that's being used, it's really about placing yourself under the mission of somebody who, in the husband, in this case, is really on a mission to lead his wife to holiness and to heaven. And John, just a quick follow-up. When you explain the difference and when you explain what those words actually mean to people with today's ears, you had said, what's the response that you get? Are people more more open to exploring what Ephesians means? No, absolutely. And what I try to do, too, is to connect to the, the Genesis uh, connection for people as well. When uh, Adam was created, God gave him the ability or the command to tell and to keep, which those words are Abad and Shamar, which means to service, work in the form of service and to protect and defend. So that was Adam's first charge. That's a charge of every man today. And for Eve, she was the helper that was created, right? A helper fit for him. And that word is a, a compound word uh, in the ancient Hebrew, which is Azer Kenegdo, which means battle partner, right? So when you start to tease this out and help our modern ears hear what the Lord through sacred scripture is trying to teach us, especially in this relationship and, and covenant of marriage, I think definitely husbands and wives are like, well, yeah, if I knew that, I would definitely want to live out this vocation in that sense, right? And what are we battling against? We're, obviously, we know we're triple concupiscence, right? We're battling against the world, Satan, and ourselves. And so what better way than for God to gift us with a spouse that's going to help us in, that, in, in this sacrament and, uh, and in, on this side of heaven? Right, to get each other to heaven. And Claire, you know, in the previous chapter, Ephesians 4, St. Paul speaks so beautifully about the unity of the body and about living in humility and gentleness and patience and bearing one another through love. And in chapter 4, verse 26, he says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun set on your anger and do not leave room for the devil. And I don't know about you, Claire, but I think that sounds a lot like what we're supposed to be doing in marriage. Uh, so in your experience as a wife and also as a coach and a spiritual director, what advice can you give to women to help to cultivate those virtues of humility and gentleness and patience in marriage? Well, I think it's interesting to note that St. Paul says, be angry but do not sin. It's so important for us to acknowledge our feelings, to be willing to go there, but take the Lord with us there, to be curious about um, why we react the way we do. There is so much that those things reveal to us about ourselves, our need for deeper healing, and, our in and they really exist as an invitation to deeper intimacy with the Lord, and if we allow them with the people that love us and who he has given um, to us to be himself for us, to be instruments and means of his healing. So family life and marriage is certainly something that stirs up a lot of emotions and feelings within us. Those aren't things that we should push away and think are not okay or not holy. But the challenge and the invitation is to acknowledge them, to be curious about them, to bring them to the Lord, to talk about them with the other, but not for them to be an occasion of sin in our lives. And we are so broken. I mean, uh, they, they say it takes three to get married, but when you do get married, yes, you're married with Jesus, uh, but also to your spouse and you and your spouse are imperfect. So what do you do when you are um, in the throes of marriage and it's difficult and you're finding it difficult to practice these virtues? I just take it to prayer, honestly, Debbie. I think that I sometimes have to go away and pray and be alone with the Lord so that I can be fully present for the people in my life. Um, having a prayer life, a consistent prayer life, and consistent being the key word, because there's lots and lots of things in our life that will take us away from that, has been life-changing for me. And it has been um, a huge uh, benefit to my marriage and to my family. It's not selfish for us to set aside time to be with the Lord. In fact, it's incredibly beneficial to the people in our lives 
that we are to be Christ to. We need to have that intimacy and that time with him um, to talk about the things on our heart, to process them with the Lord, to invite him into them so that then we can go into our homes and our families and our marriages and be Christ for the other. Thank you for that beautiful response. And, you know, Jenna, there are a lot of times in our culture where we see women, especially young wives, who play it off as kind of a joke to to go behind their husband's back on certain things like overpriced coffee habits or hiding the shopping trip receipt. We think that it's funny and we think that it's cute, viral, um, but those things seem like they're trivial and that they're, they're not a big deal. But you would actually argue that they are. So can you explain what the problem is with these little signs of disrespect? Yes, I had an experience early on in our marriage where I had this learned behavior of uh, shopping or mostly shopping, but um, it kind of emanated out into other areas of my life that um, I would hide it from my husband. And I remember distinctly one time I bought something and hid it in the trunk of my car. And I asked Later on, one of my kids asked um, my husband to get something out of the car, and he opened the trunk and found the thing I had bought, which I think was just a lamp. It was something insignificant, um, but he, we had specifically talked about not spending money. And again, back to that communication, really communicating about where are our budgets, what's going on, how can we help the family be good stewards of what we've been given. And I stepped out of that. And again, that can feel very insignificant, but it broke trust uh, between my husband and me. And again, it was something that was learned that I didn't really necessarily think was a big deal. And I think that's pretty evident in the culture. If we look at social media and what people think is funny to do to our husbands, to our spouses in general, to kind of poke fun at them, or again, do something behind their back that maybe they don't know about, but it's funny because we're getting away with it. I think, as you said, we think it, it's cute or um, silly, but that actually is significant in honoring each other. Again, like I said, to honor the dignity of the other person. Um, I, I have learned actually over the past few months that I want to not only respect my husband and who he is um, as my spouse, as my helpmate, as my battle partner, I loved that, John, um, but I also want to honor him. I want to take that a step further and say, I don't want to just do what we've decided on, what we've communi communicated about, but I actually want to honor you. Um, so I want to go above and beyond what I think is just respect and, and to show you love beyond that uh, for my own self to grow deeper in love with you, but also for our family um, and generations to come. And it's, it's not just going behind his back that's a problem. It's also things like blatantly disrespecting him or talking back to him in front of the kids or venting about him to your friends or detracting about him to your friends. So what can women do to overcome those behaviors? And can you also explain why those types of behaviors are so harmful as well? Yes, it's really been interesting for me because, again, I think so much of how we act in any relationship, but particularly in marriage, it's so much of what we learned. Um, we grew up, even subconsciously, how we saw couples, mostly our parents, um, but other couples, how they treated each other, and we learned that behavior. And so, so many times, <laughs> my husband and I have both had to say to each other, hey, when you spoke to me like that, I felt disrespected. Or when you um, treat me this way, especially in front of the kids, I don't like that. I don't like what we're teaching our children in that moment. And oftentimes for me, especially, I'll say to myself, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that my tone was doing that to you or disrespecting you. Um, I, I want to respect you and I love you enough that I will try to pay attention to that so that I don't continue to do that, especially because I don't want my children to learn that. And I have found myself even sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we're videoing our family or um, just doing something with our kids where we catch ourselves. I'll watch a video back and I'll hear my tone. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, I do I sound like kind of aggressive or mean or I don't mean to sound like a 
that that sounds silly, but I want every part of my heart and how I speak to people to be kind. I want to be like Jesus. Um, and not to say that discipline is inappropriate. That's on a whole other tangent with family life, but, um, I want to respect my husband. I want to honor him. And when we don't, our children and our families will learn that for the future, for their future relationships and not even just in their marriage, but friendships and how they speak to people and honor people. Um, so it's not, again, I guess the biggest thing that I've come to understand and take to heart is that none of this is trivial. It means a lot. Um, how we speak is an overflow of our interior life. Um, so going back to what Claire said, even to have time with the Lord, to learn the Lord's voice, to learn how he treated people. That's the fruit. Um, that's what I want to come out of me as well. What a beautiful response. And oftentimes we, when we're getting into arguments or spats with our, our husbands, our spouses, we want to have the last word. We want to be, we want to want be the one who fires back with that snarky, sarcastic response. Like, yeah, I'll really get them. Uh, you may, you may think that you won the argument, but what have you lost on the other side? Uh, so we just have to remember that Ephesians five is not, is not about who is in charge and who is serving the other, but it's, it's about who is loving as Christ loved and who is, who, who are we building up and who are we fighting alongside and not against? And John, as we keep reading in Ephesians five, St. Paul says in verses 25 to 27, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, without any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. I have goosebumps just reading those verses. What does that mean for husbands? I mean, simply put, it means that we have to return our wives to God better than we receive them here on this side of earth. Um, but really, if we understand the idea, the concept of authority, authority is given for the benefit of those whom you have authority over. So it's never to the benefit of the person who has that authority. So for us as husbands, it's really important that we uh, have a mission, as St. Paul teaches us, to really sanctify our wives, sanctify our children, that everything that we're doing at, to the best of our ability, recognizing our sinfulness, is for their sanctification, which ultimately is for their salvation, to lead them to heaven, to get them to heaven, to help them build virtue in their life. So, you know, when, when St. Paul talks about this, our, as husbands, our example par excellence is Jesus Christ. And how did he, the bridegroom, suffer and serve his bride, us, the church? He handed himself through the passion, death, and resurrection. And so for us as husbands, it's a tall task, no doubt, but anything's possible with God, that we are called to emulate that, and we're called to bring our wives to holiness and our children as well. So, you know, we have to return everybody that comes in our path, most specifically our wives and our children, back to God better than we received them. Amen. And how can husbands begin to practically uh, exercise that spiritual leadership that's required of them as the head of the household? Sure. I, I, I kind of summarize it in like four different words. I think it's lead. Start by leading, taking the lead, right? In, in everything that you do, whether that's the, 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 the prayer over the meals before you eat as a family, whether it's you the first one to kneel in prayer, leading the family rosary, it's just lead, leading them to mass, leading them um, to, to contemplate and reflect on God and, and the, the good that he's given us in a day. All of that's important. So lead is, is absolutely critical for us as men. The other piece is live. Live the faith. Faith isn't something we do as Catholics. Faith is something that we live. It breathes. I like how Jenna had talked about, you know, it's coming, the, it speaks to your interior life. I think about the Lord, you know, from the fullness of the, the, the heart, the mouth speaks. And so your interior life will show how you behave. What is it going on inside of you, those passions and whatnot? So live a life of faith so that your kids, your wife can see that this Jesus is Lord over your heart, Lord over your soul, Lord over your mind, Lord over everything that you do. So I would say live. Um, and I'm, the other thing is love. Love is Christ's love. We got to get vertical before we can get horizontal, right? And so Jesus teaches the greatest, the two greatest commandments, love God, love neighbor. We cannot 
learn to love our spouses, our spouse and our children until we learn to love God first. And so it's love in a way that gives yourself away. Obviously, we know that in the sense of self-gift. Um, and, and the last piece is just remember to learn, right? Learn as men, learn your faith. It's a big task. We got over 2,000 years of Holy Mother Church on top of what we gained from our, our, our Old Testament and Jewish ancestry. We've got a lot to learn. And, you know, we're not going to stop learning until we get to see the beautiful face of God. So it's, it's those kind of things where I think are practical steps that we can take as men to start to, to be the head of our homes, as St. Paul calls us to in Ephesians 5. Amen. And when we think about how Christ loved the church, he died for her. He gave his life for her. And that is a huge call to action to husbands to love their wives and to go to battle for them, but also to go to their own death even for them spiritually and, and death of self, as you had mentioned. So wives, pray for your husbands because they have a big, big, big responsibility. And Claire, we were talking a little bit before the show about how long we've been married. You've been married for 27 years. And we were talking about the difference between the honeymoon period uh, when everything is blissful and wonderful. And then as you start to settle in and uh, things get real and, and there's a, a change that happens, even if it's a slow shift, can you talk to us about how to practice biblical submission in those difficult times, um, especially if you have those deep-seated negative associations with that term? You know, life is hard. Um, marriage is difficult. And yes, we, we enter into it with a lot of high ideals and, um, and hopes and expectations of what it's going to look like. And part of the death to self is dying to what we think marriage is supposed to be. Uh, the Lord is constantly purifying us in so many ways. And marriage is one of the, if, if that's your state in life, if that's your vocation, then that is one of, if not the primary way that you are purified in order to be able to receive. I mean, when we say die to self and we say, you know, purification, um, these are things that are in, designed in order to cr increase our capacity to receive and give even more of ourselves. So as, as we enter into marriage and a life of self-gift and we realize that it's gonna require much more of us than we ever thought possible, we should realize that the stripping and the purifying and the painful process of dying to self, surrendering to the other, surrendering to God's will as it presents itself to us in the details of everyday life in the present moment as it comes to us and the, the challenges with kids, with finances, with um, personality issues, with as, as you know, the healing of our past comes into our present, like everything, all of our wounds, all of our junk, all of our sin, even family and generational stuff, we bring that with us into our marriage. And over time, that stuff comes to the surface and has to be dealt with um, for our own holiness. And certainly it's causing our spouse to be purified as we bring all of that with us. So, so it is so hard, but I think that what we can remember in all of it, as the honeymoon phase passes away very quickly and we start to realize what we said yes to when we said yes, we wanna remember is that it's all for the sake of something greater. It's, for, it's to empty ourselves of what is um, not of God, die to that part of us so that we can be fully alive in Christ so we can have an increased capacity for him, for his life in us so that then we can make a greater gift of ourselves to each other, to God, to the church that so desperately needs the example of marriage, um, lived generously and selflessly and in imitation of Christ and his church. So important what you say about pushing through those, those difficult times because we need to see those examples of the holy spouses, like you have said. And Jenna, during difficult times, um, for couples who are experiencing resentment or hurt in their marriage, how can St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians help them find healing? Mm. I think the primary um, thing that's coming up for me in this beautiful conversation is just this idea of, of dying to yourself, of being a gift of yourself being the gift in your marriage. And 
as Claire said, um, marriage can quickly, uh, we can be hit with the reality of it. Um, sometimes quickly, sometimes not quickly. Um, and the reality of all of our stuff can come up. Um, and in those moments, there's this quote by St. John of the Cross that I love, that I tell myself weekly, if not daily. Um, and it is, where there is no love, put love and you will find love. And so again, in all relationships, but especially in the vocation of marriage, um, if at, all, at any time you're struggling to love someone or there is no love or you feel distant or there's a chasm that you can't seem to cross, that's when we are called to die to ourselves, to what we feel entitled to, um, to set aside those resentments or frustrations and to simply love. Um, and that's where we will find love. And so I think St. Paul is, is just encouraging us in that, in the difficulties of this beautiful and life-giving and incredibly sanctifying vocation to continue to love even when it's hard. Wow. <laughs> I got goosebumps again. And that's amazing where there is no love, be the love, right? Yeah. And John, in the last minute of the show, I can't believe how the time has flown, uh, but in the last minute of the show, could you give a, a piece of parting wisdom, perhaps for a woman out there is watching, thinking to herself, well, I'd be happy to submit myself to my husband if I could just trust that he was going to do things the right way. What would you tell her in the last minute of the show? Yeah, I think... Um... Never lose hope in, in this. I think um, a lot of what's been talked about today is the fact that there is this, this denial of self. There is a, a humility about marriage um, that requires us to recognize that we're called to, to lead each other to heaven. And I think as a, as a wife who is struggling to see her husband make the, the right choices or the righteous choice for that matter, um, I think you need to lean on your vocation as the spouse because your prayers are efficacious your fasting, uh, your model, your behavior of all of that are efficacious. And this is coming from somebody who's a revert to the church, whose wife was very much in that very scenario, whose prayers, fasting, model, and behavior, conversion of her own heart led me to be the person that I am today and to take up my obligation as head of my home. So don't lose hope. Dear sisters out there, cling to the cross. Um, that, that is our call. And, and recognize that your prayers as a wife are super powerful. Um, don't ever give up on that and recognize that you have a lot to say and a lot to do on your husband's behalf in order to get him to heaven. So don't lose hope. Uh, God will answer your prayer in his timing in the way that it needs to be answered. What a great note to end on. That is all the time we have for today. And if you enjoyed this discussion, you can share it with a friend or watch even more episodes of The Catholic Sphere on our online streaming platform. It's EWTN.com slash on demand. Claire, Jenna, John, thank you again for being with me here today. And thank you for joining too. We'll see you again next week right here on The Catholic Sphere. Oh.